So Fabian is a senior researcher in the Department of Training and Movement Science uh, at Johannes Gutenberg University, Mainz. He graduated in sports engineering at uh, Otto van, how do you say? The University of Magdeburg, maybe. The University of Magdeburg <laughs> in 2012 and received the PhD degree from the Johannes Gutenberg University, Mainz in 2018. His research interests include the recognition of patterns in biomechanical signals of human movements using machine learning methods. So thank you, Thomas, again for the introduction um, and the possibility to present our work here at the, at the workshop. So first of all, I would like to introduce the concept of explainable AI or explainable artificial intelligence with an example from the field of image classification. So on the left side of the slide, um, we can see an image depict in a viaduct, but also other objects like a house and trees. So let's say we want to classify this image. Therefore, we can use already pre-trained machine learning models like these neural networks for image classification. In our example, the model predicts a class viaduct. So on the one hand, this is already a great achievement. But however, one of the downsides of current state-of-the-art machine learning models is their black box nature. So this means that the user cannot easily understand why the prediction was made by this model. That's the reason why the field of explainable AI um, emerged in recent years. So the field of explainable AI provides methods for explaining machine learning models and their predictions. So in this example, a technique called layer-wise relevance propagation was used, and we obtain an um, explanation why the image was classified as a viaduct. The red regions here in this explanation picture are relevant for the class viaduct, while the blue regions are relevant for other classes. So we see that the arc is the most relevant feature here, and that also makes sense from a human point, because we would properly use uh, a similar feature for this classification of this picture. So machine learning approaches have been increasingly used in biomechanics, um, and we would like to obtain similar explanations for this type of data, as we saw for the image before. Um, since explainability methods have not been used in biomechanics before, we wanted to demonstrate the possibilities and as well the usefulness of explainable AI methods for this field. So in the last years, we have uh, published different papers on different classification tasks and as well data sets. And today I would like to give you some insights that we have gained from those analysis. Before doing so, I would like to describe in a little more detail the general workflow that we have used in a similar way in all the papers. So in the initial um, explainable AI paper, we used person classification as the example because I was really confident that we couldn't get a high performance with the machine learning model in recognizing persons from biomechanical um, data. So a sample of 57 healthy subjects participated. Um, each of the subjects walked 20 times, uh, a distance of 10 meters, and marker data and as well force play data were recorded. Subject walked barefoot over ground, self-selected walking speed. So classical biomechanical lab setting that we've used in the study. We calculated ground reaction forces as well as the full body joint angles for one stride of each trial. And afterwards, we time normalized, scaled, and vectorized the data. So for the ground reaction force data here in blue, um, we concatenated um, the signals anterior posterior, medial lateral, and vertical of the right foot stance phase, and then afterwards, the ones of the left foot stance phase. We provided this one-dimensional input vector um, to the machine learning model here, deep neural network, and trained it for person classification. In this example shown here, we show the data from subject number six to, um, to the model, and the model predicted the correct class. But similar to the initial example, we don't know why the prediction was made by the model. So to tackle this problem, we used well-known explainable AI method called layer-wise relevance propagation, and we adapted it for this one-dimensional input data. So for each value of the input vector, um, Layer-wise relevance propagation determines a relevance score for the prediction of the model. Um, so in our example, now shown here, we get a color coding um, and the yellow and the red color coding highlights the most relevant input values for the prediction of subject number six. So now we 
take a closer look uh, on that by answering some questions. So first we wanted to know which input values uh, do machine learning uh, models use for their predictions. So in the upper part of, of the slide, you now see the vectorized input signals of the lower body joint angles for subject number six and below the relevant scores corresponding um, for each input value. So there is relevance propagation give us a score for each of the input values and that is shown below. So we can observe that the highest relevance scores um, are not randomly distributed across this input vector, but there are certain regions highlighted here with the cycles um, that are most relevant for the classification of subject number six. The same applies to the ground reaction force data. So the input um, relevance scores highlight that the vertical ground reaction force um, during terminal stands was most relevant for the classification of subject number six. Um, and that's an observation um, we could make in all the classification tasks I've done so far. So that always multiple signal regions and not single input values are relevant for the prediction of machine learning models. Um, we further wanted to know, okay, do we have differences between different yeah, machine learning methods or do they use similar signal regions for their predictions? Um, so the upper part here um, shows again the ground reaction force input data that we have used and all the uh, panels below um, show the input relevance scores for one of the machine learning methods that we have used, um, you know, like artificial neural networks, support vector machines, multi-layer perceptrons and their yeah, convolutional neural networks. And we can see here that when we have a look on the highest uh, relevance scores, that they agree to a large extent between different machine learning methods. So this means that the model pick up on similar signal regions for their predictions in the person classification. However, differences can as well be observed in the variance of the input relevance scores from different gauge trials. So we see here the highest variance can be observed for the linear artificial neural network, whereas the lowest variance can be observed for the linear support vector machine and the convolutional neural networks. And interestingly, this goes along as well with a more robust um, testing performance result. So we had an experiment where we added noise on, on test data and had a look, okay, how good are the models performing? And that is really correlating. So these are the models which seem to have a better representation of the classes and then as well have a more robust um, performance. Yeah, we further wanted to know which features do machine learning models uh, learn in order to classify different persons. So comparing the input relevance scores from different subjects enables us to do that. So highlight, highlighting the ground reaction force data that are unique to an individual subject. Um, so we can get an idea of what the individual unique signature of that subject is. And the comparison of the input relevance scores from different subjects indicate that individuals were classified by both. So different gate features or the same gate feature, but then the curves have different shapes or magnitudes in this phase. So I have as well an example. So the highest input scores for subject 21 are here in the mediolateral um, force in the beginning of the stance phase, while the vertical ground reaction force of uh, at 90% of the stance phase were most relevant for the identification of subject 28. And in comparison, um, the highest input relevance scores for the prediction of subject number six and 28 are both at 90% of the stance phase in the vertical force. Um, an interesting observation that we uh, had is that we have symmetries um, in those relevance patterns. So this finding indicates that symmetry information between the left and right body side might be important for person classification um, and might be a reason why it's not that easy to cheat such a person recognition system based on, on human gait. So because the systems are, are working somehow symmetry information for the identification. Um, in addition to the person classification, we also investigated class specific characteristics that machine learning models learn in order to classify clinical gate data. Um, for our experiments, we used um, a subset of a publicly available data set called GateRec, 
Um, the gate rack data set comprises current reaction force data of healthy controlled subjects and patients with different functional gait disorders. Um, the gait disorder class includes patients after yeah, joint replacement, fractures, ligament ruptures, um, and related disorders to the ankle, knee, and hip. So um, we have a variety of disorders in this data set, which might be as well a limitation in, in some terms. Um, all the individuals walked unassisted and barefoot at self-selected walking speed. And from the table, you can see that the data set is more or less balanced with respect to persons per class. Um, with the class healthy control is the largest and the class hip is the smallest one. In total, we had an amount of 1,000 trials for our experiments and we investigated um, yeah, binary classification tasks. So we um, investigated a classification healthy control versus the hip class, versus the knee class, versus the ankle class, and the classification um, healthy control versus a joint gait disorder class. Um, we did not use a multi-class classification because the performance was not so good. And we had a fear that the performance might be not good enough in order to get well its explanations afterwards. So we decided, yeah, to stay with the binary classifications and investigated them. So I will briefly um, explain the, the figures that show the results for the classification here, healthy control versus gait disorders. Um, the convolutional neural network achieved a prediction accuracy of 88% for this task. And in subfigure A, we see the mean waveforms for both classes. Subfigure B, um, we can see the averaged relevance scores for the healthy control class. In subfigure C, um, we see the average relevance scores for the gait disorder class. So please note here that the binary, in binary classification tasks, the relevance scores are complementary, mm -hmm. which makes it as well a bit easier in the interpretation because um, a highly relevant region for the one class automatically is highly irrelevant for the other class. Then. Um, we found here um, again that multiple signal regions are relevant for the classification of healthy control uh, subjects and yeah, the gate disorder class. Um, the highest relevance scores were found in the vertical front reaction force of the affected side. So the um, organization is here now that first the data of the affected side and then the data of the unaffected uh, side is displayed. But we also found signal regions um, of the horizontal ground reaction forces that were relevant for the classification, as well as signal regions belonging to the unaffected side. So both of these findings um, were also in the other classification task not shown yet here. Then we ask ourselves, okay, are the regions um, that show yeah, high relevance scores also um, different in terms of statistical analysis. Um, in the background now, um, for each of the subfigures, um, you can see, or we visualized uh, here, the results of statistical parametric mapping as gray boxes. So those were the regions where we found significant differences between the two classes. In subfigure D, um, we as well computed the effect size um, as Pearson's correlation coefficient in green. And the total relevance, which is the absolute sum of the relevance scores in, from subfigures um, B and C, um, displayed in purple. So the effect size is the SPM based result, and the total relevance is the layer wise relevance based propagation result. Um, the stati uh, statistical evaluation here shows a high degree uh, agreement between um, yeah, layer wise relevance propagation and the SPM analysis. So many of the input um, features used by the machine learning models as well were significantly different between the two classes. Um, and yeah, total relevance and effect size curves as well show positive strong correlations. Um, we showed here two examples. So as well, the healthy control versus gait disorder classification and on the bottom um, healthy control versus hip. Um, this is the one with the smallest correlation um, between the two methods. Um, there are also regions um, 
where effect size and total relevance have a similar behavior. Um, however, the SPM does not indicate significant differences in those in those areas. And there's well um, highlighted here in red um, regions with disagreement. So there um, are two cases: either the model uses uh, regions where the effect size is rather small, or regions where SPM uh, indicates significant differences, but the ML model did not use um, those those regions. Um, but of course, there will be a need for systematic comparisons between those methods if you want to highlight advantages, disadvantages of, of both approaches. Um, but that's for us was the first evaluation to get more insights what these explanations might, might be or not be. Um, yeah, we then asked ourselves, are the relevant regions um, in line with a clinical assessment? Um, so two experienced clinicians um, observed the relevance um, uh, results and considered many of the relevant regions um, according to Leyva's relevance propagation as well as cleaning, uh, clinically meaningful. So, for example, here um, uh, shown the classification task healthy control versus the ankle um, class. Um, the Leyva's relevance propagation results are in agreement with the work from Sun and colleagues. So, the also 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 identified um, yeah, differences in the vertical and anterior posterior ground reaction force during terminal stands, um, and as well highlighted no um, differences in the mediolateral forces. And as well, Lehrer's relevance propagations has only small relevance values. There. Finally, um, we wanted to know if machine learning models are able to learn different strategies for individual participants or patient groups. Um, so far, yeah, we have used model explanations by averaging um, the individual predictions across all gate rights of a given class. And I showed you the average, average curves. Um, and we now wanted to go the next step and conducted a more comprehensive analysis for model explanation. And we clustered the individual explanations using a method called spray and analyzed um, yeah, the clustering results. Um, we now will take a closer look to the subfigures again. So of the gate disorder class, so the joint class um, classification. Um, please note here that we didn't explicitly provide this information, ankle, knee, or hip, to the model. So the classification was healthy control versus gate disorder, and the model did not have any information about the subclasses. We just use it here for, for labeling in order to see, okay, do the models, yeah learn strategies for certain certain disease on their own. Um, then in subfigure E, the participant label, so each of the color is unique for, for each person um, in the plot. And in subfigure F, um, we have the clustering obtained by spray, uh, indicated by color coding as well. So single clusters uh, can be related or highlighted that they contain explanations of samples belonging to one participant here. So yes, the machine learning models seem to learn strategies for individual subjects. And there are as well clusters where the models learned yeah, specific patterns of subclasses here highlighted. So for this cluster, we can see that the model learned um, similar features for a group of samples belonging to the HIP class. And when we look at the participant labeling, um, we see that those are the explanations belonging to two of the patients. So by using spray um, or a clustering approach, we could um, show that the machine learning models can learn different strategies for individuals and patient groups without explicitly get, get giving them the information. So, to sum up the talk, um, we could see that machine learning models for gate classification use multiple signal regions for their predictions. Um, yeah, from a machine learning perspective, explainable AI methods can help us to better understand um, the models and their predictions. So this might allow us, for example, to compare machine learning methods, evaluate the effects of data pre-processing on the models and then on their predictions. So, and the hope is that in this way, the machine learning approaches can be improved for specific classification tasks. And so we can build their robust models that can be used in practice. Um, 
Yeah, from a biomechanics perspective, um, explainable AI methods can as well enable us to identify new insights. So for example, what I mentioned, the symmetry information that is important for the person classification or relevant regions on the unaffected side in the gate order the disorder classification, because that's something the clinicians reflected to us that they mainly use in the ground reaction force, the vertical forces, and they saw some additional benefit that might be um, by using models that as well consider the horizontal forces. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions if you have. And it's very interesting to see how machine learning is actually dealing with uh, biomechanics data. Uh, any questions here or raise a question? Okay, thank you for your good presentation. I want to speak at your modeling time, for example, today. Uh, and we want to design a project specific model, for example, open source software. Your model can say that, uh, for example, for this object, this this part of going, this joint is more uh, motion of this joint is more subject specific, so we can more focus on uh, angle, for example. At least we can say that the model for person classification used those features in order to identify this person. If this information can be used for subject specific models, maybe, but I, I don't know. But it's a way to start maybe to create subject uh, specific models in order to extract these informations. Yes. Okay. Uh, I can see did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I think it's related. I'm wondering how you see the risks of this being used for less friendly purposes, such as uh, indiscriminate surveillance of people and this, uh, finding individuals in crowds. Um, I mean, personally, I don't want to work in this area, but I know there are other working groups that are doing exactly this. So my purpose here is to provide information about the subject that can be used in a clinical setting in order to improve rehabilitation programs. So that is my, my aim here. But of course, the information can be as well uh, used for civilians. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, are there any, is there any, we can do another quick one. Okay, then uh, let's thank uh, Fabian for his, for his talk. Um...